Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Tony Miracker, and welcome to uh, another meeting, uh, Simply Toronto meeting. Um, this is our February meeting, and uh, it is uh, student focused. Um, tonight's meeting is sponsored by our uh, technical conference, um, which we're going to be holding in June of uh, this year, and it will be uh, virtual in nature. So uh, do mark down in your calendar that I believe we're looking at around the 9th and 10th of June, uh, possibly the 11th. So we're still at the planning stages of this uh, virtual uh, get together. Uh, tonight's um, meeting is IP for broadcast, virtual immerse, esports, machine learning, data science, and more. Um, this meeting was arranged by Nadia Aftab, uh, Richard uh, Rick uh, Grunberg, and Mansoor Madafi. So tonight we will have um, uh, five speakers. Renard Jenkins, who is um, our membership VP at uh, SMPT Home Office. And his day job is uh, Vice President of Content Transmission Production Technology at Warner Media. Following Renard will be Ryan Morris, systems engineer at um, Arista Networks. Uh, Francois Bouchet is technical sales representative at Airy Canada. Uh, Cliff um, Lavav, Lavavi uh, is director and of LUV Studio Services at TFO, and Cameron Reed is Global Business Development Manager uh, Esports at Ross Video. Um, if I can um, brag a little bit here, um, uh, SMT was awarded two uh, Emmys um, this past year um, on two standards that they produced, uh, standardization of uh, the SMPTE 2110 and also the uh, standardization of uh, broadcast electrical fiber optic cable. Uh, that's the SMPTE ST30 or 304 and ST311. And this will be ME number uh, 10 and 11 for SMPTE. So um, yeah, this is a, uh, a, a bragging moment for SMPTE and, and it's congratulations to all the standard bodies, uh, people that have worked towards those two particular standards that, uh, that garnered this, this award. Uh, tonight's evening, just to give you some uh, protocol behind it, uh, uh, Rick will introduce and read the bios for each of the presenters. Um, Nadia will be managing the chat room and um, um, Mansoor will be the backup person just in case some of us lose our internet connections and he will um, uh, pick up the, uh, the feed and uh, so we don't go black. Um, Questions will be at the end of all the presentations, so do save your questions. And as well is if you do have a question, please enter it into the chat box and Nadia will uh, pick them up and, and uh, at question period time, we'll ask the questions to our presenters. So first up is uh, Renard and Rick, if I can uh, get you to uh, take over here and uh, introduce uh, Renard for us. Sure, first of all, I just wanted to thank you, Tony. I just wanted to welcome everybody on, on behalf of SIMTI and uh, myself. Thank you very much guests and speakers for being here. Students, this is the second year we've done this and uh, it was really a wonderful opportunity last year as well for students to sort of engage with these wonderful professionals in the industry, not just the presenters, but also uh, some of the SIMTI members that are amongst us in the, in the grouping of participants tonight. So thank you everyone for being here uh, from colleges and universities across Ontario. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker and that's Renard Jenkins. He's currently SIMTI Vice President of Membership 
and Vice President of Content Transmission and Production Technology for Warner Media. With over 30 years in the television, radio, and film industry, Renard Jenkins is a two time Emmy Award winner, the 2020 Broadcasting and Cable Technology Leadership, and 2017 Innovator of the Year Award winning cutting edge technologist. In his former position at PBS, he was responsible for, for the strategic direction and operational management of PBS's entire media supply chain. He is a champion and advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the technology and media industries. He's also a strategic advisor to the board of directors of the Washington DC chapter of the National Association for Multi-Ethnicity and Communications and the chair of the Warner Media Technology and Operations Diversity and Inclusion Council. His volunteer work with local youth and his beloved Bay Area also earned him a healthy image award from the local Teamsters Union. So thank you very much for being here, Renard, and uh, for welcoming our, our students and members. Well, thank you very much, Richard. I really appreciate it. And uh, well, I'm here to talk about SMPT. And um, I, I really want to, uh, to take a moment to explain some of the wonderful benefits of being a SMPT member, especially uh, at the student level. Um, I can tell you from my experience that I started at the student level many, many years ago. And um, it was one of those things that really helped me throughout my career. The networking aspect that is a part of this uh, really is something that's very unique to our industry. You have access to individuals who are actually creating the tools and the standards that you actually utilize in order to create content. And so I think that that is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. The first, you know, the, the first year um, is actually free for students. And I think that's very important for us to say. And uh, then after that, it's $15 for as long as you're a student. Um, the other thing is you actually get real world experience and the opportunity to work with individuals who are actually doing the day-to-day -day jobs. So as a part of being a student member, you get a subscription to the journal, which has been printed for over, uh, well, I think it's something like a hundred years now. Um, you also get access to all webcasts except for the executive X, uh, the executive webcasts, which are really about executive leadership and, um, and education. Uh, you get discounts on our virtual courses and uh, the self-study area. And you also get discounts to our annual conferences. And of course, in this time, those conferences are virtual. So we've tried to make them uh, accessible to everyone. Next slide. So like I said, the, the idea of being a part of SMPT puts you in a position to have individuals who can help you with your career, not just getting started, but throughout your career. And I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. But really, there's a, you can go on the website, you can take a look at the job board, and you may actually find out that the hiring manager is someone that you saw or you heard speak or something like that, and you can instantly make that connection with them through your SMPT membership. I think that's a wonderful thing that, uh, that can actually help to position you properly in an industry that uh, is notoriously smaller than you think it is. Next slide. So as I said, professional guidance and camaraderie. Um, I really want to bring your attention to the core, the, the, the top, well, my top left uh, of the page. You will see two gentlemen there. Um, those gentlemen are Larry Thorpe and uh, Hugo Gagioni. As I said, I started in SMPT as a student. And these two gentlemen were actually at the forefront of technology when I was a student. They were the individuals that I read their papers. I used the tools that they created. I was, I was lucky enough to understand the standards because I had a wonderful professor in school who uh, just allowed me to dive deep. And then to have these individuals not only help me throughout my career, but to look at me as a peer um, and, and, uh, and support my career and support me as I continue to grow and learn has been a wonderful thing. Um, it's one of those things that you can never really sort of put in, you can't really put it into words. I can just simply say that to have those that you looked up to consider you to be a peer 
and give you the space to grow is one of those things that I could have never imagined as a kid. So, you know, it's not just about standards. It's not just about a bunch of old grizzly guys sitting around kind of talking and chatting it up. It's actually about guidance, camaraderie. It's about standards, yes, but it's also about being on the front end of what's happening in the industry. Next slide. So we also have awards for students. The Student Paper Award is one of the most prestigious awards that we give away every year and we do it at our conference, usually in uh, the October, November timeframe. And individuals who actually get an opportunity to write a paper that gets published in the journal, it's then voted on by a secret or uh, not secret organization, but a secret committee of individuals who go through these papers to look for the one that stood out from all the rest, the one that's advancing our, um, our industry. And uh, some of the young people who have uh, written these papers and won this award have gone on to have extremely successful careers. So think about your opportunities, think about the things that are out there and the things that you're learning from your professors and see if you can be a part of that. Next. And the other thing is because all college students at some point would love to have money um, is the scholarship, the Louis, the Louis F. Wolf Jr. Memorial Scholarship Fund. And that is actually um, a $5,000 award to help with um, tuition. It's for SMPTE student members. And you can be, and you know, anyone can apply for this, um, uh, for this award. Um, but there, the criteria is here on the slide. I'm not going to read it for you. But you can also look this up on the website. It is a wonderful opportunity. So take a look. Make sure you put your applications in and good luck. Next slide. Now the standards and interoperability are really what we're known for in SMPT. We, you know, a lot of people look at us as the premier standards organization in the world and we are a global organization. As many of you know, with the way that we are distributing out content today in every conceivable way, there has to be something that puts guardrails around those things in order to make sure that that same piece of content can be viewed on various platforms. Well, that's what standards do. They ensure inoperability when they're followed properly. They also create a level playing ground for um, manufacturers and those who are creating devices and things for us to actually view and consume content, whether it is radio, whether it is video, whether it is film. So all of those things are a part of what we do at SMPT, and we would love to have some of these young, brilliant minds that are doing so many wonderful things in school. We'd love to have you there with us. Next slide. Now, some of the new initiatives that we've started to focus on within SMPT is media in the cloud, and you're going to hear a little bit about that. Esports, you're going to hear a little bit about that. And Pro AV because there's so much room in our industry and there are tons of people who are out there doing AV, whether it is for businesses um, in the corporate world or whether it is for weddings, but all of those tool sets require standards and the ability to interop with each other, which is where we feel that we can actually help in that space. Next slide. And another thing that we're looking into, and you're gonna hear a lot about that tonight, is virtual production. Virtual production, and you know, a lot of you know that right now that's being used on The Mandalorian, but it creates such a wonderful space for us to play right now. And for those of us who are really in the cameras, really into content capture, we love the idea of that. It's just a whole new world of using some cool technology to produce something very wonderful. Um, in-camera visual effects, vol volumetric capture. I'm so excited about it that I actually have started building a small miniature virtual production set at home to uh, actually utilize my, um, my action figures in the back for some pretty cool stop action stuff, simply because 
I've gotten my daughter into it and we like to have fun with the action figures, but it's something that I love so much that I figured, you know what, if there's a way for me to create a small LED wall at home by using, you know, a nice 4k monitor that has a curve to it, um, I'm going to try and do it. So we're playing around with that and having some fun. And we've got a nice little remote control for our camera and, uh, and a robotic arm to help us uh, as we kind of make our stuff look hopefully cool. We'll see how it turns out. Maybe next year I'll, I'll bring a small piece. <laughs> um, so next slide. So that's really it about us. You know, join us today if you're not a member. Um, like I said, the first year is free and the next years after that are $15 a year. Um, and if you have any questions, please reach out to us at membership at SMPTE.org and I will make sure that someone gets back to you and uh, helps you through your journey. Um, and if I can ever be of any help, you can look me up on LinkedIn. Um, I try to be as responsive as I possibly can. So Richard, I'll turn it back over to you and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Renard. <laughs> Wonderful having you with us. So uh, I, I do want to also encourage students, please, and all to don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat. Uh, we are monitoring them and uh, we will answer them at, uh, at the end. And please, you know, at the end, we, we'd love, part of this is your participation at the end. So please come up with those questions if you don't understand something for our experts here. So next, uh, we're very fortunate to have Ryan Morris with us. Ryan Morris is a systems engineer at Arista Networks with his focus being in the media and entertainment vertical. While at Arista, Morris has worked with Arista's numerous partners to assist in creating a better user experience for all those embarking on the IP transition through enhanced monitoring systems and in implementing best practices that relate to both multicast and PTP distribution. Prior to joining Arista Networks, Morris was involved in many IP deployments while working at Image Communications and CTV Bell Media. This includes numerous Olympic Games transmission networks covering the encoding decoding paths over the WAN, as well as uh, uncompressed signals over IP and LAN. Morris graduated from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada, with a Bachelor of Applied Science in Electrical Engineering. Thanks so much for being with us uh, here today, Ryan. Thanks, Rick. I'm going to share my screen now. So uh, one second. Can everyone see my screen okay? Rick? Rick? Yep. Yeah. Awesome, thanks a lot. Hey everybody, my name is uh, Ryan Morris and I'm a systems engineer at Arista Networks and I'll be discussing today, uh, just giving a brief overview of uh, IP over, over media. The conversion of IP for media can really seem like a different language. And if you're looking at this right now and you're not absolutely falling over, over yourselves laughing, Go study some networking. I promise you this will be absolutely hilarious very soon. Let's get on to uh, the topics now. Consuming content has changed significantly, especially even from when you know I was a child. I remember I would have to come home every day after school or whatever and be home at a specific time to watch a specific TV show. And if I missed it, I'd actually have to use a, you know, a VCR, which I don't even know if they if they're around anymore, probably not, obviously, to make sure that I would actually be able to catch what I wanted to watch. Obviously, that has really changed right now and is changing continually in, you know, into the future. Platforms now, co content distributors require platforms where you can watch anything you want at any time you want, regardless of where you are. You need to be able to watch content on demand. And in order for that to happen, you need to have the infrastructure to actually support it. And that's really where the conversion to IP really comes in handy. And we'll be getting into more details about that later on. But this transition has also really impact advertising revenue. And part of the reason for that is now advertising is more, can be more difficult. It's not on your traditional platforms. Less and less people are watching traditional television and they're focusing on watching content on their you know, on laptops or on their smartphones or whatever. So this is really changing things. And this 
there have been so many opportunities to change. There are so many facility upgrades where customers are, de are deciding that they want to upgrade from their older baseband routers, possibly because of scale, possibly because of all the different formats that they have to distribute. And they're switching to an IP method of distributing these signals within the facility. One of the reasons for doing that is because in an IP network, you know, we don't care. The, the network vendors, we don't care what the content is really. To us, it's just IP packets. What matters is that there's enough bandwidth to get from point A to point B, and there are no packet drops, no interruptions from path A, from point A to point B. Again, we don't care. A packet is a packet is a packet, whether it's going to be SD, HD, 3G, UHD, ultra UHD, whatever, it does not matter to us. And there have been a lot of changes in media in, uh, media during the pandemic. There are still many, many upgrades going on throughout the world. And I'm, I've been involved in, in quite a few, but there are a lot of changes. Part of the reason for that is it's just harder to get people onto site now to actually install equipment or make changes to the system or convert workflows. So because people are having difficulty or customers are having difficulty getting that done on premises at their facility, they're looking to other ways of getting this done. And one method of doing that is by converting into the cloud. And we're seeing a lot of this now where customers are looking to have play out channels in you know, AWS or Azure or Google Cloud, for example. So the pandemic has really changed how we get content out because we need to get it out now. And obviously there are many delays because of this. And to get the content out now, whether it's again in the cloud or on, on a, in a facility and we wanna upgrade, IP is the enabler. All these different parts within media and entertainment like listed on the left there, whether it's production or editing or live video broadcast or, or play out or storage or storage flow cons uh, consumption, that's all being done through IP because really it, 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 simp it can simplify a lot of things because everything is just you know, some packets away. Everything is just an IP address away. You have a lot less equipment that's being cascaded one after another, after another, and after another. Everything is just available in the network. And of course it takes some expertise to make it work, but once it does work, the flexibility and the scalability is really there. It, 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 would, it would take a lot to under provision a router to the point where you would not be able to scale anymore because we are getting significant speed increases in, in the switches, you know, up to you know, 400 gigabits per second for a uh, single fiber optic connection. Well, let's look at how, what we're trying to solve also with IP. We have to look at what was, you know, how, con how content was distributed possibly in a facility before it was an IP. So in the baseband approach. So if we take a, you know, a single baseband router or, or bulkheads or you know, different ways of distributing the uh, SDI signals or HDSDI signals, we relied on you know, coaxial cables where we would connect into a single spigot and it would be say a router input or it would be a router output. And it would be a signal in moving in one direction, a single signal. So it would be one signal in one direction on one piece of cable. And that would add a lot of, you know, that can add a lot of cost and also just adds to the insane amount of cable runs going through a facility or in an OB truck, for example. There are probably thousands and thousands of these cables going under the floors or above the ceilings because they had to distribute signals from equipment room to another equipment room, to a monitoring area, to master control area. There were so many of these connections and it was again, very inefficient just because it's one unidirectional with one signal per cable. Enter into IP, specifically with the SIPD 2110 standard, where we can encapsulate, for example, the active video from a signal into IP. And we have the bit rates, whether it's 720p or 1080i, we can see what the bit rates are there. 1.1 gigabits per second, 1.3 gigabits per second, and so on and so forth. For you know, UHD, you're over 10 gigabits a second for every signal. Then we see further to the right there, device connectivity or switch to switch connectivity, whether it's gonna be a 10 gig connection, a 40 gig connection, there can be 25, there can be a hundred gigabit connectivity and also 
400 gigabit connectivity now from switch to switch. This allows you to essentially multiplex or just carry so many, so many video signals on a single connection. And also it's full duplex. It's both directions simultaneously. So we might be able to fit 80 720p signals on a 100 gig connection, but that's going in both directions. You have a lot more density because of this. With all these signals being carried over a fiber optic connection, like what you see at the bottom of the screen there. This reduces for an OB truck, for example, this has significant weight reduction and therefore also significant less, significantly less gas consumption as well, since there's less weight, very advantageous. So what would a system actually look like possibly? This is a, a very, very basic system from a networking perspective, where you have all these different endpoints connected into those two big devices on top, which are in this case, Arista switches. These are called chassis switches. And there's two of them there for extra redundancy for SMPTE 2022-7 redundancy. Now that is for the endpoints where the endpoints send a signal to both switches simultaneously and the receivers request those signals from both switches simultaneously. And on a packet by packet level, it determines, the receiver determines which packet it wants to de-encapsulate or decode, for example. That adds significant redundancy because as what that will allow you to do is perform, say, upgrades on one switch. Or even if one switch got completely powered down because of a power hiccup, you wouldn't lose anything in your video, in your on-air video chain. That's pretty cool. Now, these chassis come in varying sizes, but just for this one, I just want to just give an example of like our, our smallest of a you know, our smallest chassis. There are what we call four line cards. Each line card can have up to say, for example, 24, 400 gig connections per line card. And each of those 400 gig connections can be further divided up into four times 100 gig connections. Now there are many devices out there from broadcast vendors that have native 100 gig connectivity. So you can do a lot of cool things with a lot of UHD signals. So these devices might be up, down, cross converters. Might They might just be in, uh, also multi-viewers. And you can also add switcher, other devices like switchers. And again, separate, separate multi-viewers if you wanted to. All of your devices that you would have in a traditional broadcast workflow can now be connected into the networking switch and transported over IP. And this and the distribution of these signals all happens within those networking switches. There's no need for DAs anymore, no need for jack fields anymore. You can monitor every single signal within the network. So you can just see here the, the sheer number of router IOs, for example, if we were to have, you could connect 384 devices into there and have them each be, you know, possibly 16 by 16 for 3G connections or something, which would give you, you know, close to like five or 6,000 by five or 6,000 in inputs and outputs. It's, it's insane. And you would never really need to scale out because this is a very simple network architecture, but you can obviously add more complexity to it by dispersing the switches in different equipment rooms. And that just gives you even more flexibility. So the possibilities really are endless when you're transitioning to an IP workflow. But that's not the only transition that's happening. We're seeing a lot of facility upgrades. Absolutely. Lots of customers are converting to SIMPTE 2110. But as I mentioned earlier, we're also seeing a lot of customers trying to migrate their playout systems into the cloud as well migrating away from their, replacing their aging HD SDI hardware, as it says in the snippet there, and, and moving the content into the cloud, for example, for either live or possibly disaster recovery purposes. But this is happening today and it will continue to happen even more and more in the future. So now that I've, reviewed a bit of the general sense of media over IP very briefly. I just wanna review some of the protocols that we rely on 
mainly multicast because you know that's you know that's what I love to do. But first, I want to review a few different ways in which IP packets are distributed throughout a network. There's broadcast, which is which says here one to all within a subnet. So if I were to you know, create an analogy for that, you know, my you know, my two-year-old upstairs, when he really cries really loudly, he broadcasts that out to the house and we all hear it. Maybe other people hear it, I don't know, but it's very loud and we all hear it, but we can't control it. Then there's unicast, one-to-one. -one. It's, it's, it's determined from the sender. So an example of this is maybe I'm gonna mail something to a friend of mine and I, I attach on the envelope the name of who I'm sending it to and where they live. That is unicast. But then there's also multicast. And this really comes in handy for routing signals within a facility because you can do one-to-one -one or you can do one-to-many. And it's totally dependent on your receiver, such as you know, your multi-viewer or your video switcher, as an example. Your receiver tells, specifies who it wants to listen to. So we can equate this almost to you know, a Twitter feed where if I had if I had Twitter and I want to you know follow certain people, I could specify who I want to follow. And then every time they tweet something, I will get uh, I will get it on my on my Twitter page as well. I will be able to see anything that they send out. And then if I'm not interested anymore, I can just leave that. I can just turn that off. So that can be an example of multicast. And again, multicast is a really good fit for specifically live uncompressed media, because it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's a total negotiation between, from the receiver perspective. You can turn on what you wanna to listen to and what you don't wanna to listen to, and the bandwidth doesn't get cascaded over each other. So if I'm sending a camera signal from one camera to four different receivers, I don't have to send that four separate times from the camera. I send it once, and the network takes care of replicating it over and over and over and over again to all of the receivers who actually want it. So it comes in very handy. And I would definitely suggest if you're interested in getting into, uh, into this business, uh, into networking specifically, that you learn multicast. It's, it's, it's very cool. So we can treat cameras, for example, as multicast sources. And we can treat a multi-viewer or a, and a video switcher, for example, vision mixer, as a multicast receiver or as a destination. So in this case, when a broadcast controller says to the multi-viewer or the mixer, I want to look at that camera, I want to look at that camera one, those devices will send out an IGMP request, an IGMP join. IGMP is a specific multicast protocol saying, I want that IP address, I want that IP address associated with that camera signal. And then through the, through the network, it will distribute that multicast signal from the source to the destination. And then when they don't wanna watch that anymore, when they don't wanna see camera one, they wanna see camera two instead, they will say, I no longer want to see camera one. I wanna leave that multicast IP address. And now I wanna join a new multicast IP address. And again, the network takes care of that for you. It's again, very cool. And in this case here, the camera, as I mentioned before, it's only transmitting its, its signal once. So it's up to the top switch there to kind of split that signal, to send, to copy that signal down to both of the other lower switches that where there are receivers requesting that traffic. But sometimes we need, you know, possibly other mechanisms here besides IGMP. And part of the reason for that is this, the source bandwidth of a sender is unknown from, from this protocol perspective. It's a set of rules, multicast. And one of the rules is that we don't know really what the bandwidth is. So I, don't, I will be treating the network, at least through these protocols, I will be treating the packets coming from a, whether it's HD or 3G or UHD or even an audio mixer, really low bandwidth, I will be treating all of those packets the exact same. I don't know if one's bigger than the other. They're all just packets to me. So where does that come into play? That comes into play based on the link utilization going from say switch to switch. So in this example here, 
I have a 12 gig camera that I want to send from that switch to the other switch because I have a device requesting it. Using IGMP, using different, these, some of these multicast protocols, I could inadvert, the, the network could choose that top red link there as the link to carry that 12 gig signal. Therefore, you would have 107 gigabits per second over a 100 gig pipe. And that is very bad news. All of those signals will get crushed and you will lose your video, you'll lose your Super Bowl. That could be obviously very damaging to any production workflow. So I would want that flow to take the 45 out of 100 link, but I can't rely on IGMP and PIM for that. I'd have to use some other methods, which I'll get into shortly. And another reason why IGMP may not always be the best answer, depending on how your system looks, is just network maintenance or cable maintenance. So in this example here, I lost that link. I lost that bottom link there that has the 45 of 100 gigs on utilization. With an IGMP protocol, which is done, which again, just wants to route from source to receiver and does not care about bandwidth. It doesn't care about, it doesn't care about how much link utilization is actually being used, how much link of the link is being used. As much of that 45, percent there, much of that 45 gigs will be redistributed over that red link. So in essence, I could take down both links by really only taking down one link. And that is obviously a bad news for any broadcast facility. So what do we do now? Well, we can use what's called an SDN. And this is becoming more and more frequent with customers demanding this type of, it, these types of assurances that they will never oversubscribe a specific link. You have an SDN, a software defined networking controller, for example, that essentially just does what it does what it says. It controls the network. It, it controls where the flows are going to be going by talking to the network through the control plane and just managing essentially the data plane. So you're going to be protocol list, no IGMP needed. So if I were to equate this to just everyday life, this would be like you know, IGMP is essentially me going down, me driving down to the ACC to check out, you know, to watch the Leafs game when eventually they, I can go there. And I know how to get there. And I will get there eventually. I know the highways to take. I know the major roads to take to get down there. But I don't know any traffic conditions. I might be really late. I don't know if there's construction anywhere. I don't know any of the conditions. So that is IGMP. SDN is having GPS navigation. It's telling me which roads to take. So I get there as soon as possible and avoid all the construction, avoid all the traffic and just smooth sailing, hopefully down to the ACC. That is what an SDN is like. In summary, media delivery strategies are in constant flux. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of media upgrades at, at specific facilities. We're seeing cloud architectures being taken advantage of. And even, you know, a lot of protocol differentiation, you know, sometimes when to use unicast, when to use multicast, and when to learn both, I suppose. That's, that's really important. But this has been done before. It's been done for a while now, and it'll be continued to be done in the future. This is not voodoo it's not a science project converting to ip it is done in reliable systems today and the, really the best part of this is there's just you know there's a lot to learn there's a lot to learn and it's great to learn new things sometimes i feel like i'm i'm like neo in the matrix where i just get multicast data just shoved into my head but it's absolutely fantastic and right now again no better time to learn these standards since they are pretty you know they are pretty new and they're getting used more and more often so Thank you very much. Hope you learned something. Thank you, Ryan. That was wonderful. Great, uh, great analogies <laughs> and metaphors uh, to explain it all. Uh, we really appreciate it. So uh, next up, we have uh, Francois Gauthier. Uh, with close to 30 years in the production industry, Francois was fortunate to work in most areas of the production ecosystem, inclu including content creation, production, post-production, product planning, design, training, marketing, and strategic planning. After a fruitful career in Quebec's production community, he joined Sony, holding various positions in North America. In 2017, he joined Arnold and Richter, Ari, where he is in charge of camera sales for the Canadian market. 
Francois also supports uh, ARI Solutions business in the Americas, which include remote production and mix mixed reality production systems. Thanks so much, Francois. It's all yours. Thank you very much, Richard. I will try to share my screen. Um, where can I go with this one? And share. Voila. Uh, I, I like every presentation up until now. I realize that there's a lot of people that were mentioned that I've worked with. There's lots of transition in technology that I was part of. Uh, one thing I do not do is to multitask. Multicast, yes. Multitask, no. Uh, and just maybe one small thing. When uh, Ryan has mentioned that there's lots of changes, especially during COVID, I am working from my basement. So if you're wondering, and I think all of you are working from home and we're trying to find any way possible to make use of whatever bandwidth is available. But today what I'm gonna be doing on my side is I'm gonna to try to give you some application of those standards that Renard was mentioning and what it means for a company like Ari and for somebody like me who's also went through it. Uh, if you look at the left side of my document, especially the little part at the bottom, this is an extract from a, a, a digital imaging journal, the version at that time, the motion imaging journal, the SIMTI paper back in the 1990s. And for those of you who are SIMTI member, follow, uh, fellow SIMTI member, you're probably gonna recognize that this article was from Mark Shubin, somebody who's actively involved for students. You might not know it, but Mark Shubin has been contributing tons of technical article. So back then, SIMTI to somebody like me when I started in the 1980s, 1990s meant that the information was extremely embargoed. What I mean by that is there was no internet back then. <laughs> that dates me, and that dates maybe many people in the group. But back then, you would get the information from the SIMT journal that was on yellow paper, by the way. That shows you how old there was. And the director of engineering, the TV station, would usually be a member of SIMT, would receive the paper, read through it, disseminate it, and then train his team. So it was really a process where you would get knowledge from working in a TV station in that environment. It was extremely difficult for somebody to come from outside and get that knowledge. Today, the information is distributed differently but SIMT is still extremely current, extremely relevant, and it's even more important today to disseminate what is important or what is valid and what is not. So to us, we're an active member of SIMT, uh, he's an active member of SIMT, and on my personal side and on the company's side, we see a couple of venues that are really important for you. One of them is the Motion Imaging Journal that has the update. And actually this edition, the workflow edition was uh, January, if I remember correctly. But if you go back to like November, there was the SIMT standard or the progress report that are published once a year. And it gives you like a, a little glimpse of, a little glimpse, I should say, of the different things that SIMT has been working on, the different subcommittees role. And that's enough to say, oh, I need to read this one and so on. In the center section, I have the IEEE database library. So if you're coming from the electronic engineering world, you're going to recognize the Institute of Electrical and Ele Electric and Electrical Engineer. So uh, this is working closely with SIMT. Uh, probably in the last couple of years, there's been a lot more integration. So the SIMT standard are on that website, where if you're a member, you have act access to a lot of these documents. And depending on your level of subscription, you might have access to some standards that are the details information, or maybe just the article in the motion imaging journal. So this is something that you need to navigate and see what you need. But the information here is everything that you need from an engineering perspective to start designing a product that is compatible with somebody else's product. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit later and also the technical conference. So a couple of times a year, different chapters hold technical conferences where you will learn a lot of information about specific topics. At SIMT Toronto, there were some chapters on IP video, there were chapters on virtual reality, 3D and so on. So all different topics that you will be able to delve into to a, to a really in-depth level and you're gonna be able to talk to expert about it. And like Renard mentioned, the relationship that you will establish with fellow SIMT member will guide you through your entire life. So what I'll do now is I'm just gonna give you, circle back, go back a little bit, who we are. Because you might not have heard of Ari if you're coming from a broadcast side. So Ari is Arnold and Richter. 
Uh, Auguste Arnold and Robert Ritter started a company when they were 17 years old. So I think it's relevant with today's students edition of SIMT. Imagine going back to the first world war when there was a lot of uncertainty, situation was really not comfortable, people are dying everywhere. It was extremely stressful, just like COVID is today. I would say it was a different time, different situation, but just what you're seeing today, imagine going back 1917 with less knowledge, less access to the internet, less information, an environment that is much more difficult uh, in saying you wanna start your company. It probably didn't make sense, but they did anyway their parents had to sign for it. And I think it's important to recognize that when you're younger, you're gonna try a lot of things that maybe other people would wait and evaluate and think, is it the right time to do that? So you are in the perfect place and time in your life to study what these organizations have to offer, like SIMT, to study these white papers, to look into the standards and to learn more about IP, multicast and all these things or any aspect of cinematography, television, broadcast distribution and so on. So if we go to lighting, just to understand how these standards apply. In the old days, and if you like at that slide, lights were really big. They had Osram light bulb and an Ari light and they were powerful and they consumed a lot of power, but they were essentially a really basic device. Power, light, that's it. There were some optical characteristic to it, but there wasn't a lot of electronic in it. Today, fast forward to 2021, completely different. If you're looking at the new fixtures that we have today, some of them have IMU, inertia memory unit, uh, uh, and that's gonna give you the position, tilt, roll, pan. You're gonna have a uh, magnetometer that's gonna tell you where that fixture is on a set. It's gonna have ambient light sensor to map the X and Y value of the ambient environment to match your fixture to that. So all these things means that we have microprocessor, we have FPG combined to that inside a fixture. So we have a computer with a light in it. And that's how we're able to address that light and put it into a system. So we need some form of standardization. So that's where we're going with SIMT. Let's look at cameras. Cameras are also the same. A long, 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 long time ago in the 1910s, 20s, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, he started in 1917. And the interesting thing is that SIMT started in 1916. So they are one year older, 105 years. So there's really some parallels between many of the companies that started at that time and how they work together. So let's take the example of cameras, same things. Cameras, when they were in film, cellular process, they would basically have many standards to indicate, let's say the registration pin. So if you would take film stock made by Kodak or Fuji or Agfa, that they would fit into your movement, everything would align. So you would be able to transfer things to your editing table, to your camera, to your projector and so on. There were lots of standard about how we stretch an anamorphic picture back on a projector at the movie side, or how do we squeeze it on the camera side and so on. So these standards were critical for multiple vendors to be able to interoperate together. Today, the cameras are electronic. They use again, microprocessor and huge FPGAs. They are extremely complex system that do demosaicing, that do debayering, de de demosaicing, and that do any type of color processing, compression. They are dealing with different type of codec. So as a result, we need to make sure that when you record something on that camera, you're able to take that drive and bring it to an offload suite, an editing suite to do your dailies and things like that. And it's gonna be important. We're gonna see in a couple of seconds, kind of like the implication on a set. If we look at digital intermediate, another example where in the 1990s, beginning of the 1990s, we had a transition from film, celluloid, to digital. And at that time, we realized how many formats existed in the film world that did not exist in the broadcast, or how many existed in the broadcast that did not exist in the film world. Many, many years ago, I used to teach on a VTR. I'm not gonna mention the model, but back then, if I counted the different format, SD, HD, various format of HD, different frame rate, uh, 422, 420, different type of color space and so on, I was probably looking at 23, 24 format on a VTR. So we came from a time where there was only 525 in TSC, one frame rate, and that was it, to the moment where I was at 23, 24 format. 
So it becomes extremely complex to ensure when every manufacturer has that many format that you're gonna be able to connect a signal from one device and go to the other. In an IP infrastructure, it's a little bit different because you're working with a physical layer that is established, an OSI level that is established, and you're working on software programming to establish these standards. But when you're looking at hardware base, that physical layer, let's say a camera, a light, a VTR, you're basically fixing that standard through FPGAs. So it means if you want to change something, you have to reprogram. And by the way, FPGAs are field programmable gated arrays. So see it as connecting different transistor on the board, but it's in a big chip that you can program to address those different transistor gates and so on. So we have some limitation. Once the design is baked in, we can modify it a little bit, but it's much more difficult than if we're doing that in a software platform. Let's go to our next slide. Where do we go from here? So at ARI, one of the things we do a lot and I'm involved with and I love and passionate about it is mixed reality production system. And it's interesting because you might not have heard the expression mixed reality production system. It's because it's a mix of augmented reality, virtual reality, traditional production, volumetric capture that is different than virtual reality. So all these things together, boil it down to one term, mixed reality production system. But I want to show you how we got from there to today. And SIMTI has evolved every step of the way to ensure that these were possible and that everybody would put their best foot forward would be able to contribute knowledge so that we would get there. It's not a single manufacturer doing that. It's not a single group doing that. It's not a single studio doing that. It's a joint project. If we look at the top left, we see a bus from the 1920s. 1930s. So that's how much physical space it took to drive the generator to power one, two, maybe three lights. We've come a long way. Today, you can have multiple lights connected on a single Edison plug with 15 amp, 120 volts AC, and you're done. You do your three points lighting, a couple of bounce, you do an entire production. So the, the evolution is incredible how far we got, but there's still some times where we need these powerful lights and we need to be able to use them, but we've come a long way. And if we look at the picture just below, we see mixed reality. We see something was shot in the 50s where they were already using a fake background with a projector. So today, the difference is that it looks real, back then it didn't, but it was already a, a tremendous step to be able to introduce that many years ago and evolve it till today. And if you look at the rest of the picture, we're gonna see where we are today. Uh, at the middle left, we see a production called New York Paris, was shot at Mel Studio in Montreal using our cameras. But what's important here is that we have a virtual background, we have cameras, we have tracking, we have a render engine that's going to create a frustrum and just render that portion. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But the idea here is that this was shot in Canada. This was shot during COVID with lots of people from different division different sub companies to be able to achieve that. If we look on the right side, we see another production. That one was called, I believe Survivor Solitaire. I forget, I'm, I apologize to my good friends at Mel. So it was another production they did. And from some of you who are working with the Epic Unreal Engine, you might recognize the subway that has been used in a couple of demos. But basically all of that was shot in Canada during COVID with limited crews, so not easy to do. At the middle center, you're gonna recognize the Mandalorian that has been the subject of many articles over the last couple of months. Uh, I know that Renard is involved with that. Uh, they've been using our product as well. But what's important is that if you look at the behind the scene and try to understand how they got there, you're gonna realize that this is not something that just appeared out of nowhere. It's years of successful evolutions, little improvement in different aspects that led us here. I love 2021 because I get to do Python coding, Unreal design, Blender 3D creation, tracking on different system, and I get to do productions with camera, work with FPGAs. So we get to tie everything together because today we have the horsepower, the technology, 
ready to put all that together and create something that looks real. It also means that traditional production benefit from that, even if there are no fake background, even if they're using traditional means, because the software improvement, the rendering time and all of that is going to help everybody. And on the bottom right, we had a Lux Machina demo. If you want to learn a little bit more about mixed reality, this is a good place to start. So there's a lot of information on that test that was done, uh, I want to say 2018. Uh, one thing I want to get to is that we talked all about standards and Reinhardt said we're not just standard, but I want you to understand how standard have an impact on our life and on everybody's life. Here I have a workflow from a camera, in this case an Alexa camera. But what's important here is that the way we process color, just, just that little portion, can be done differently for different deliverable. Maybe we record log C, maybe we record raw, maybe we record ProRes. Maybe we're going to process the ASC CDL, American Society of Cinematographer Color Decision List. Maybe we're going to process a video look profile, the LP. Maybe we're going to put a 709 LUT, maybe a 2100, maybe a 2020. All expression that, if you want to know more, are in the CMT documentation. But what's interesting here is that if I exchange material, not only with other vendors, but even within a single manufacturer on a, sing on a full workflow, I'm going to see the impact that it has. Let's look at a couple of examples. Before I go to those examples, one little tweak or one little hint, I love metadata. I'm passionate about metadata. And this is a screen grab of the metadata we're recording on our camera. There's 221 fields. That's just a camera. We didn't even talk about lighting that collects also probably as much metadata. But we have some of that metadata that is to describe the video picture, some of them the shooting crew, some of them the visual effects, some of them the lens deformation, all these things put together. There's a lot of information. But once we take the standardization plus that metadata and we move it around, we can do incredible things. For example, we can enter lens metadata into a software to see when the focus puller, whom we call the first AC on set, is going to do a transition between actor A and actress B. And that is psychology. We move from one person to the other to attract the attention somewhere. But all of that can be extracted in a computer software with the metadata embedded so that we can track maybe a position of Fostrum on a big reality production system, a zone on that fake screen that follows the actor so that we don't need to take a gazillion GPU horsepower to be able to process the entire wall when the camera is just pointing at one little portion. It could also be because once you finish shooting, you're gonna take that footage, you're gonna send it to an NLE, nonlinear editor. So the editor is gonna start cutting the portion that are good, good takes and bad takes, and then that person is going to send it to color, to finishing, to grading, where they're going to do all the coloring process. Then they're going to bring it back to editing. Then the ADR is going to have the audio track, and it goes back and forth. So if every time we had to take huge amount of data and move them from one facility to the other, let's say a post-production facility in Toronto, go into a color facility in Montreal, going to an ADR facility in Denver, Colorado, all of that would be cost prohibitive to transfer all that data. So the data exists on a SAN somewhere. And what we do is we move instances of that data. So the video stays on a computer, on a server, in a building. And what we do is we move XML or AAF. We basically move a map of the video how you're going to do the transition, what audio level you're going to put, what color correction you're going to put. So the data, the video, always stays safely in one place, and we just carry smaller file. So this is an example that has a direct impact on how fast the editor or the colorist can receive information after it was shot. But it also means that as we're developing these new technology and that we're working with SIMT, we can find some more efficient codec we can find some more efficient color spectrum. As a result, if you're working on a set today, the last person who's gonna leave is usually gonna be the DIT, the digital imaging technician. It's the person who takes the card, does the transfer, maybe does conversion of format and so on. 
Well, you need to realize that if the DIT is still there at one o'clock in the morning, uh, that person is not the only one working. There's a transport crew with bus and everything that are waiting to leave and they cannot leave until he's gone. So there's a lot of people who are impacted. So we need to improve that workflow and we do that through standardization. I'm almost done, almost done. Lighting is the same thing. We're also dealing with subsystem. We take light and instead of driving that light with just an on or off or intensity, we're able to change the color, we're able to change the intensity, use saturation, we're able to put some gels on it, things like that. So that means that we don't have to come into somebody's house and add gels to the window, we're able to do that electronically. But it also means that in, let's say a mixed reality production system, we would be able to take a video track, a virtual track, let's say a sun going up, and we'd be able to remap that sun to address some photosite, or not photosite, some, some, some pixel, some light emitting diode on the fixture so that you're gonna be able to recreate the sun with something that gives you a lot more power, a signal that's much more directional, that is much more realistic and emulates the sun compared to taking an LED wall. So all these things are again, process workflow that needs standardization. So all of that means that we need to standardize things like resolution, color spectrum, frame rate, encoding, all these things put together. And how do we do that? We do that with SIMT. We do that with an organization that lets every manufacturer come in and say, here's what I've been working on. And then there's a subcommittee that analyzes it and says, I think you could change this or this or this, there are discussion back and forth. And then once it's baked in, you have a recommendation or you have a standard and then companies are gonna look at it. So for example, if somebody was to say, Francois, I wanna to connect to your Amira camera, what kind of signal comes out of it? I could spend two hours on the phone explaining it, or I could say, hmm, go to the SIMT standard and look at the standard 2081-11. That's the standard we have for that connector. So they go in, they take that paper, and they have all the information on how they're going to build their product, their software, their decoder, their metadata reader to be able to see that data. It appears on their picture, and then everybody's happy because we can move forward. Because in the end, it's all about looking at that technology from an engineering perspective and saying, this is not what we're selling. We're not trying, the, the viewer at home is not looking at the multicast the simultacast, the broadcast, they're not looking at any IP connectivity, they're looking at a picture. And what we need to do as professionals, as engineer, as manager, as people in the industry, as creative, we need to find a way to make sure that that technology is seamless to the creation of that story. So standardization means that we prevent a picture that disappears on air, we prevent all these issues that we've dealt for years. And if you work in a TV television station like I've done for many years, every time the picture gets dark, you start to panic, your heart beats and everything. So we thankfully in 2021 are doing much better than we did 50 years ago because we have these standards and because SIMT is there not only to help elaborate these standards, but also to communicate them with everybody. So that's how at ARI, we see SIMT, the importance of the organization within our ecosystem and everybody else's ecosystem. And that was it for me. Thanks so much, Francois, for that very insightful look at uh, how, how the industry, the production film industry is connected with uh, SIMT and vice versa. Really appreciate it. Uh, so next up, um, we have Cliff Lavallee. Uh, who sadly, uh, he had a family emergency, so he had to pre-record his Zoom uh, on his on Zoom with me just before today's event. Uh, but having worked with him on the development and the systems and lighting for them, I'll try to answer as many of those questions uh, as I can to the best of my ability. So Cliff Lavallee has worked uh, with uh, global tech companies on reinventing the production process for TFO's <clears throat> digital educational resources and was the catalyst for the creation of LUV. Cliff has led production teams, engineers, and broadcast technologists on innovative projects with international recognition. His recent initiatives include leading the production and operations teams for all LUV external productions. With his combined passion for production and technology, Cliff continues to embrace innovation for TFO and virtual production. So I will actually be presenting his video.
Thanks, Rick. Thanks to uh, Simti for asking me to present this evening. Uh, welcome to everyone. Um, I hope you enjoy this presentation. It should give you a glimpse into uh, virtual production. The uh, LUV uh, Laboratoire d'Univers Virtuel means Virtual Universe Laboratory. Um, virtual production is the use of specialized tools to recreate a virtual environment in line with the production's concept for use in a real-time studio setting. So a lot of uh, what we do is uh, around real-time uh, production in a green space using virtual tools. We'll start off with a little video and then uh, we'll get back into it. We've been waiting for you. Flexibility, right at the tips of your fingers. Technology so advanced that we are now limited only by our creativity. Let's make something extraordinary. So this video was uh, created to promote our studios invite producers to come and see what TFO is uh, doing in the new. I'll touch on uh, a, a bit later on how it was made. So Group Media TFO, a Franco-Ontarian public media company offering award-winning content on television, digital platforms, and initiatives and applications. Uh, so much of what we do in the Louvre is centered around the development of uh, the broader educational initiatives. Uh, virtual production is not only there a tool that can immerse uh, talents and get the audience involved, but it could also help hook the viewers to continue down a certain path on a certain subject. So a lot of it is geared towards education and uh, initiatives that we do in, uh, with partners. In 2015, uh, we identified the need to want to innovate uh, our studio production um, uh, or the way we uh, shoot in, uh, in, in studios. And we'd been looking at virtual tools for some time and nothing really seemed to fit the bill. So the decision was made to start uh, trying to use some gaming tools. So we tested with Unity and Unreal just to see where we could land. And it wasn't until NEB of 2016, we found a product called Zero Density, uh, well, Reality from Zero Density. And that that's what really allowed us to bridge the gap between the broadcast technology and the gaming technology. We were the first uh, broadcast facility in the world to run a virtual production in real time uh, through uh, broadcasts using gaming tools. So since then we've had uh, also added some technology. So we have some ray tracing abilities. We have uh, black tracks tracking technology, some 4K cameras. And in the near future, our plan is to transition to a full UHD HDR facility. Uh, so the benefits of 3D virtual production, I guess the, the one that stands out the most is the ability to integrate talent into a 3D environment and make it look good. So ideas like um, having real shadows and reflections and, you know, the detail uh, is important when you're adding, uh, when you're keying someone in a space that is not a, a real space. You have doing this all in real time. So that's a huge benefit, being able to, to shoot in real time uh, in these spaces. Uh, freedom in design. So a lot of detail and flexibility when you're designing in virtual world, because you can go into like, uh, you can go into uh, uh, fantastical worlds, uh, creations, or you can go photorealistic. This really depends on, on, on the approach of uh, the production. Uh, for live production, uh, obviously, if it's in real time, that means that, that, that you're on air and you're rendering a composited image uh, during a live production. You can also pre-record and walk away at the end of the day with a composited uh, content. Uh, and the, the other use of this type of technology is doing previs. Previs is pretty much what it says is pre-visualization of uh, the environment. So in the past, when you were in a green space, uh, you wouldn't always know how that was going to look uh, until it got back to post-production. 
and it could have challenges, you know, things weren't done exactly as it was planned. Now being able to view that ahead of time during the actual shooting saves money and time in uh, post-production. Here's an example of uh, the tools that are used. Uh, so one of the reasons virtual production has become more pertinent in the last years is the ability to be more precise and also actually bring some performance uh, to the table with the technology. You know, being able to maximize the use of the GPU uh, in the systems, being able to, uh, you know, rely on technologies like green screen that's been around for a long time, but more recently looking towards technologies like LED to uh, be able to give enhance even more uh, the rea uh, realism in the, in the backgrounds that you're using. Uh, the LED, you could imagine in a large enough studio could be costly. So uh, with a healthy budget, um, it's a good choice. Here you can see on the upper left, there is a, the, uh, let me just get the laser pointer out. In the table here, you have a lot of green reflections. Uh, on the right side, you can see all the green has been removed and they've added in a background and you're seeing the key. So this is a, this is a shot of a monitor on set while we were shooting. And you can see this in real time. This is what the director is seeing on set. So like I said earlier, uh, no surprises when you get back to post-production uh, or uh, you can actually use the key that's there uh, live. T talent tracking. So the tracker is on the person as a microphone uh, would be. Uh, as the person would be walking around the space, the gaming engine understands the position of that person in the 3D environment. So this example shows a person around, walking around that pillar. It's, the pillar is the red uh, plane in the middle of the, uh, of the screen. And as this person walks around, the engine knows to turn it on and off because this red plane in the background, which is usually invisible, uh, determines where that person is. So as it moves in front of the pillar, it'll switch the person to foreground. And as it goes behind, it'll switch the person to background. So that's how that, that works. The other uh, feature we have in our, our uh, studios, which is important for virtual production, is the uh, tracking of cameras. So on top of this camera here on the right, there is a small camera that shoots up to the ceiling, which uh, sees all these little white labels that are up there. And that creates a map. And this map helps to um, navigate the graphics. So this screen here, you can see all the little yellow dots are the representation of the white labels that were in the ceiling. Whenever the camera moves around, pan, tilt, zoom, all that information from the map as well as the lens data, it's sent back to the engine. And then it determines the proper perspective so that the, the engine knows where to place the background in real time as the camera is moving around. In the film and TV world, we have seen in the last uh, year, a little more than a year, but in the last year, there's been quite a few projects that have come up uh, since, uh, since we've been doing it a few years ago. So you have the you know, big names like Apple TV getting on board with the Oprah and Obama conversation just around the holidays. Before the holidays, Mariah Carey's Christmas special with Apple TV. Weather Channel USA is doing some amazing things uh, to show some uh, weather simulations, NHL hockey, you have Disney with Mandalorian. So virtual production is uh, here to stay. Uh, I think it's uh, moving into a lot more areas uh, than ever. Wanted to touch a little bit on some of the productions that we do internally. I'm cruising through this. Uh, the This is a production called Kankazu. It's a TFO project that's for uh, children and it's being released in, a, in fall 2021. So we're getting a little bit of a sneak peek. Uh, this is the concept artwork of a camper in the campground where uh, it all takes part. These are the two main characters, Annette and Babette. They are two goats that play music and they have fun and educate children through the everyday situations in the campground. Here's a view of what the campground looks like. 
So it's from the playground. It's very kid-friendly kind of uh, artwork. In this scene here, it's uh, helicopter POV. Uh, it shows how large the world can be. So when we're talking about shooting in front of the uh, camper over here, uh, this is where the, the main set is. You could easily move over and start shooting here in the virtual world because it's literally a, a, about a five minute uh, switch over to get the virtual environments uh, to change positions. Uh, it would be an enormous cost to rent out a campground or, you know, there's a lot of costs and time savings uh, related to this type of uh, project. Here's just another uh, view. I'm going to play a little clip of the show and then uh, come back. Oh, I just have to pop back. Sorry about that. I'm going to pick another spot and show here. So this scene. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, no worries. Oh, hey, nice photo, by the way. Huh? But you know, if you keep picking your nose, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this scene here is a scene that was shot to see all waist up. Uh, it's a virtual background with some real elements. The next scene I'm going to show you is actually the green screen of that same scene. So uh, here you see how uh, we're set up with some physical props. We have uh, some everybody's in green, We're, the physical space, the assets in the space allow to give kind of a, a play zone for the actors, for the puppeteers. Uh, we're shooting everything above the waistline, like I was saying, and these, uh, they're also doing the voices live. And so we're, we're just recreating the space. So it's really interesting to see how it all comes together on, on screen after uh, you've shot it in the studio. You could also interact with objects, so that's why it's nice to have physical assets in the space sometimes. Moving on to a different stylized uh, sets, so you'll see a few examples now of different styles of sets. So this is a something that's geared to more more towards our uh, teen audience. Uh, it's a futuristic looking set. The hosts they're sitting on some green boxes, apple boxes. And the hexes have been adjusted so that they can sit at that height. So let's say you had six people in that set, you would just tweak the hex hexes to uh, accommodate the amount of people that you need. So you could adjust it up and down. Uh, the other thing that's interesting in this uh, set is the asset, which is the video screen. It's not a video screen. It's you know any asset can be texturized with a video source, and that's what we've done here to give it a kind of hex feel like the the, the set has. This is a sketchbook uh, type world uh, where the host is presenting a literary passage and the story kind of unfolds around him. Uh, all this was designed using VR tools. So we're able to design sketchier, sketch type look with uh, VR tools. Uh, another look that's approaching more photorealistic is architectural sets. So you can, uh, this is the exterior of Penn Station in New York that we worked on. Uh, they wanted us to put real people in the environment and, you know, on the street side here, you have three real people and everything else is uh, virtual. This is Jack and the Beanstalk. So you'll see here in the foreground, uh, there's some wind in that set. So automatically the ferns in the foreground are just kind of moving around a bit to represent the uh, wind. And then here on this shot, you see how the background's out of focus. That happens uh, automatically depend on, depending on the lens settings. Um, and they can also be tweaked to give more out of focus, to give more depth of field or uh, remove some. This uh, shot was a uh, kind of like the Obama interview where they had someone uh, brought in virtually. So the doctor on the right is in our Toronto studio. 
the doctor on the left is in the UK. So we were able to put them together. Notice the shadows around the uh, feet uh, of the doctor on the right versus the doctor on the left. There's a little difference, but the you're able to really make it look like that person's in the space. Here's another example of the same thing. So upper left, you have one studio. Bottom right, you have the other uh, green screen setup. And then the upper right, you have uh, them married together uh, to uh, in a virtual world. So that it looks like they're actually uh, in the same space. And as that camera is moving around, uh, it's tracking both of them. So it makes it look like they're really there. Now going back to the first video that I presented, um, this is a bit, has a bit of a moody scene. Um, imagine if I go back one slide, imagine the upper left uh, is the green space we're working in. So the brightness associated to a green space is quite uh, high, but you're able to achieve results like this using some virtual tools and combined with some uh, physical lighting. So in the tools that we use, there are some virtual lighting tools as well as uh, in combination with the lighting director, we would work at getting this kind of mood. This is a jib shot from above in our studio. And uh, there's an activation of an animation which made the rocks fall away under, uh, to, to kind of fall away as if there's nothing there, uh, just space. And uh, as we move forward, you can see that we've also got a, a wide shot that makes it look like we're at a far distance, much larger than what we could ever do in our studio. So it's another trick we can do with virtual tools. Here's the where we start using the black tracks technology. There's a tracker behind uh, the boot and uh, you, you, can, you can't see it, but as she steps down onto the floor, uh, you, it, which looks like she's stepping into space, all of a sudden the tracker activates the effects that are programmed in the engine to start causing uh, ripples on the floor. Similar kind of effect here. You have uh, the, pers the, the globes that are floating around. And as the hand gets closer to the globes, uh, there's a tracker just behind the wrist and they kind of uh, move away from the hand uh, with uh, some settings that are pre-programmed. It's just another uh, scene to show the, the color quality. So on the, uh, the right-hand side, you have some blue that's added in and a little bit of a red tungsten tinge on the left-hand side. This shows uh, that the virtual tools can really enhance uh, the colors and even in that very bright uh, scene in the green space. And I, I mean, the, the lighting director and the virtual operator really need to work together to, to, to take advantage of both uh, tools. So that's pretty much the, the content that I've, uh, I've presented for tonight, but there's some other stuff going on in the world that is related to gaming and, and design. Um, so it's not only, you know, like let's take an example, the NASA uh, spacewalk training. There's people producing content for NASA for spacewalk training. So you got designers, you got producers, you got, uh, there's a, a bunch of, of content being created for different reasons. Another cool use of some of the gaming tools is in classroom teaching. There's a Ohio teacher who has decided to get his high school students to design museums based on their history lessons. And then the last uh, thing I'd say is that that's pretty cool on this page is the architectural design. There's a firm in the US that is, they're doing their designs uh, in whatever tools, but then they're also meeting inside on a weekly basis inside the designs that they're actually working on. So they can walk around and point things out and see where uh, there are issues. So they have all their engineers there and they're talking about the space while they're standing in it or in that environment. So there's some really cool uses of tools in gaming and uh, a lot of uh, production uh, going on at different levels. So I just wanted to say thank you, but also uh, say that it's a great part to be into uh, virtual production. It's a great time to be involved with this and uh, it's, it's kind of spreading. So uh, we're really enjoying what we do in our studios. And I'd like to thanks, thank you very much for, for listening and don't be afraid to jump on in virtual production. It's not as scary as it looks uh, technically. Thank you. So I'll say a, a little uh, 
Thank you to Cliff for, for, for putting together that presentation for us, even in the tough circumstances he's, uh, he's been under. And I, I do want to add to it as well, having worked with Cliff and his team uh, since the beginning, uh, <clears throat> it's quite miraculous and wonderful uh, being a, a lighting director and a, a technical person uh, for the first time where I've lit hundreds of green screens and it's all about sort of lighting so evenly and perfectly. It's wonderful being in that space where we can now uh, play with lighting and the virtual elements as well as real lighting. And as you saw in that sort of one with the, the very moody scene that we that we did, there was a bit of re real lighting in there as well as some of the uh, some of the virtual uh, lighting that was put in there and the interactivity. And I actually we don't have to light the green wall perfectly perfectly. Uh, we can light it to a much lower level and we could actually get moody lighting where we have some sort of contrast ratio and we can add color to it because it's actually sampled uh, the background. So uh, kudos to, to Cliff and, and the team there and uh, it's wonderful working and working in that space with them. So uh, next uh, we were supposed to um, have uh, Afsun Sudi uh, with us. Unfortunately, she as well uh, fell ill and was not able to join us. But uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Cameron Reed with us uh, from, uh, from Ross Video. So Cameron uh, Reed began directing and producing live multi-camera esports productions in 2014, making him one of the first professional director producers in the industry. His work has aired on ESPN2, the NFL Network, Disney XD, Twitch, YouTube, and, and Hulu. His credits include Madden NFL 2018 Championship Series, uh, Intel Extreme Masters Oakland 2017, and FIFA Inter Interactive World Cup. He joined Ross Sports and Live Events team as the eSports Business Development Manager in 2009, 2019. Thanks so much for being uh, here with us today, uh, Cameron. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me, Rick. Let me share my uh, screen and I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so yeah, my, my presentation today won't be quite as technical as some of the other ones really, you know, esports, I get a lot of questions all the time just about like, what is esports? And, and truth be told, esports uses most of the very similar techniques as other forms of entertainment anyway. It's just uh, HDMI signals out of the back of computers instead of straight uh, SDI out of the back of a camera, right? Um, so I won't get too technical. Uh, I'll mostly kind of talk about like the overview of the industry. Um, and I know most of the attendees um, are university students. So uh, hopefully a little bit, I'll tell you also about how you guys might be able to go to work uh, in the industry that I've bet my career on. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself, although I think Rick took care of most of it uh, for me. Um, this is the part where I try to fit in with all of you guys as the young one in the crowd. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I'll do the best I can there. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I started my career um, right after I graduated college in 2012. Um, so, you know, he, Rick mentioned I started directing in 2014. That's true. Um, I was only a PA for a couple of years before I started directing, which is just, it's crazy. It still kind of blows me away that the speed with which uh, the career took off. But, you know, back in 2012, there was literally, I think, 20 of us in all of North America who were doing esports production for a living. Um, and I was in a fortunate position where I had a degree in broadcasting. Um, and that made me sort of unique. And so, you know, to the moon, kind of like uh, GME stocks or what they were hoping they would be at least. Um, yeah, and so my first directing job was at BlizzCon in 2014, uh, which was a bit of a trial by fire, but, you know, I had a good education and knew the things I was supposed to do. I kind of had an understanding of how to do them, and um, I guess I did an okay job because they kept calling me back. Uh, I went on from there to direct a lot of um, big uh, shows in North America in esports, um, and thereby kind of the big ones uh, really globally as well. Um, and then I joined Ross and, you know, I don't, I don't say any of this to impress you guys. I just say this to impress upon you kind of the experience I've had and the needs that I think esports has right. Um, from a production standpoint, um, based on, I've been doing it for a little while now. Um, 
first I'll start with just sort of a little bit of uh, history, right, of uh, esports. So I see esports, what is it, right? Well, I see esports as the story of how the perception of video gamers went from something like, you know, even uh, one of my favorite characters of The Simpsons, um, to something a little bit more like this, where, you know, they're uh, literal rock stars. Is that video playing? That video might not be. Anyway, it went from, it from nerds to rock stars um, in less than 20 years, right? And, and how did we get there? Well, uh, about 20 years ago, a company called Blizzard Entertainment came out with a game called StarCraft. Okay, and then uh, later that year, they would release a game called uh, Brood War, which was an expansion set to StarCraft. And it was really this game, Brood War, uh, that would go on to be like the mother of all esports. Um, this right here is a clip from South Korea, uh, esports championship in Seoul in the year 2000. Uh, that's a SK, uh, that's a, one of the most legendary esports athletes of all time, right there, Slayer's Boxer. Um, and look at the size of the crowd they had in the year 2000 in Seoul. And look at the excitement, right? And these guys had costumes. Uh, they're, they're making their own visors just to see on the outdoor LED so they could see this moment right here, which I promise you, if you played Brood War, was a cool, exciting moment, uh, even though it just looks like pixels on a screen, maybe at this point uh, with the way graphics have come along. Um, but yeah, this was already happening 20 years ago, guys. They were way ahead of us over there. Um, we think of esports as this new, wild sort of phenomenon, but it's actually been going on for kind of a long time. Um, and fast forward 20 years, now this picture was taken inside of an arena in Seattle. Okay, so it sort of has arrived now in the West, right? And, and that's mostly just to give you perspective in terms of, um, Again, like it's not necessarily this brand new thing that's been going on. Uh, I'll talk a bit about like the industry now and the sort of esports landscape, uh, the esports ecosystem, right? So it's kind of divvied up into like five main categories. Um, you've got the game developers, that's where everything begins. Um, a unique thing about esports compared to traditional sports is, you know, nobody owns basketball. Um, but a, a small people, a small group of people very much own League of Legends. Uh, and so the money really all starts with them. Uh, TOs is an abbreviation for tournament organizers. These are the people that put to bring all the teams together, organize the prize pools and a sponsorship that pays for the prize pools and, and kind of put on the big live events. Obviously, there's got to be teams. I won't spend too much time talking about teams today. Um, then production, which is probably the main thing everyone here is interested in, and then distribution. How are we getting the content out to all the fans? Um, so I'll kind of go through one at a time. Um, I won't spend too much time, but developers, um, these are kind of the big five that have made big investments into esports so far. There's more than this, um, but these are the biggest uh, names, the biggest titles, the most popular esports on Twitch. Um, now, there, there's... The, the, the story here is that the money again starts with them and it's important to understand that to them, to Riot Games' and the Epics and EAs of the world, this is advertising. It's really effective advertising because you can actually kind of make money directly back on it potentially, right? Um, and even if you lose money, it's kind of not that big of a deal because if you spend 100 million on esports in 2021 and you only make 90 back, in a certain sense, you got a hundred million dollar ad campaign for 10 million bucks. So you see how it doesn't necessarily have to be a profit venture for the developers. It's, it's marketing money and they'll spend money to kind of give these games more life, if, uh, as it were, by keeping audiences interested, keeping people playing, trying to get just as good as the guys they watched, right? Um, so that's where the money starts. Generally, um, the, the developers, they don't necessarily have uh, an expertise in doing much besides developing video games, so they'll bring in the tournament organizers. These are companies like ESL, MLG, I should update this slide, um, they got bought by Blizzard, um, but DreamHack, OGN. I also do put the developers themselves because like specifically Riot Games and Blizzard Activision, own basically their entire ecosystem in-house. Um, they've even hired, they've hired events professionals, 
production professionals, the, the whole nine yards. Um, to them, they want to control everything. It's a, it's a product of theirs as they see it, right? Um, and, and so they want to have total quality control over their esports products as well. But generally, the developer will hire a tournament organizer, right? And the tournament organizer will then bring in all of the teams, okay? And the teams are going to compete. And these are not five teams that are necessarily the five biggest teams or the five most successful or most popular teams in esports. But I chose these five teams because those are five faces I think most people probably recognize. Uh, and that is the financial backing behind some of these guys. Um, and I promise you that complexity logo before Jerry Jones bought in didn't look like that. That is, uh, I mean, that's basically the Dallas Cowboys star. Uh, Complexity's logo wasn't that before Jerry bought in. But the point is big money is noticing esports. Big money is investing in esports. And they're making a bet that esports is going to continue to grow the way it has. Okay, so again, uh, back to the just beginning. Developers spend some money on esports as advertising. They spend it hiring a tournament organizer who's going to bring in all the teams. And they're going to bring in the production. Now you'll notice on this slide, uh, there's only one new logo uh, because the tournament organizers and the developers themselves are doing production. So again, I mentioned Riot and Activision. They do their own production. They own everything in-house. Uh, ESL was one of those tournament organizers. So was OGN uh, that I showed a few slides ago, right? Um, they increase their value to valve or any of the other developers by also offering production services so yeah we can we've got all the contacts at the teams we can get a big venue we can get the sponsors to put up some money for the prizing and hey we can also do your production for you right um and so everyone is kind of doing everything in a certain sense too in esports you know like i live in la and in la production is everything is its own company everybody's self-employed so even you know, you got a lighting company, a rigging company, a special effects company, and it's all these different companies that come together to make a movie happen. But in esports, it's it's really only a few players, if not one company owning everything, um, it, which is unique, right? I think the jury's out on how long or whether that'll work in the future or or how sustainable that is. You know, kind of becomes, in my opinion, maybe a jack of all trades versus a king of one situation. Um, but hey, what do I know? I mean, Riot Games and Activision are clearly kicking butt, <laughs> right? And, and that's their model is they own everything. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is distribution. And there's two key takeaways from distribution. Um, the first one is that Twitch is king, okay? Um, a lot of people have come along and tried to unseat Twitch. And I, I don't know, look, you know, if I put on my prediction hat, eventually somebody's going to have to probably come up with a product that can actually compete with Twitch. But I don't know who it's going to be. I don't know when it's going to be. In the meantime, it's important to know Twitch rules. Um, we found out that it, people weren't um, on Twitch because Ninja was on Twitch. They were on Ninja because he was the best guy on Twitch. And when Ninja left Twitch, nobody watched Ninja anymore. Right. Um, and and so the second takeaway, understanding that Twitch is king is as important for engineering students such as all of yourselves or broadcasting technology focused people. Twitch is not a, a, a UHD platform. Um, in fact, it's barely even what I would call like a true 1080 platform. Um, they have the same bit rate at 1080p that they have at 720p. So it's like, yeah, you've got a bigger canvas, but you have the same amount of paint that you used on that smaller canvas to paint it with. So can you even really call them 1080 is kind of cheating, right? Um, that's important because there's a huge move in our entire industry towards UHD solutions right now, right? Um, 12G SDI or you know, IP uh, SMPTE 2110, there's all these different standards that are competing for UHD and esports. It's kind of like, well, hey, man, 90% of my audience is on Twitch, and I don't even know if you can really call it 1080 for them. So, you know, there's an argument to be made for future proofing when you guys are out there as professionals, you know, and if you've got a boss who's got some money, sure, build a UHD solution. But if you send a 4K signal to Twitch's server, you know, it's going to get downscaled before it ever hits your audience. Um, so that's sort of the wide shot. 
I hope, uh, I know it's fast and a lot of information, but that's sort of who are the players? How do they interact with each other? Where's the money come from and where does it go? Um, sponsors can get involved in all of this too, but they're just brands. They're just going to throw money at something if they think they can get people like use eyeballs, uh, the young ones. Um, so what does esports need um, in terms of its production needs, right? Um, so what, what esports really needs is high impact, high efficiency solutions. And, and that's sort of a buzz phrase. I know it's a little corporate marketing-y, but it really rings true for me um, because esports has to sort of do more with less, right? And that's sort of what high impact, high efficiency means to me when I hear that, that buzzword phrase. Um, we have to look like the Super Bowl in order to attract the sponsors that the Super Bowl gets, but we don't have that budget yet, right? We're a, a bit more modest on budget still. And I know we've grown a lot, but I'll give you some perspective here. Um, there was big news before COVID that esports became a $2 billion industry in 2019. And believe me, from one of 20 dudes doing this in, uh, in 2012, to $2 billion industry uh, heading into 2020, like, yeah, baby, let's go. I've made a good bet, right? Feels good. But again, to put that into perspective, I think the Dallas Cowboys are probably a $5 billion organization and they're just one team within one league. And when they value esports at $2 billion, you're talking about esports, you're talking about the whole industry is valued at 2 billion, right? So again, I'm not down, uh, dude, I bet my whole career on esports. I'm not, uh, uh, I think it's bull, right? I'm a bull on esports. It's just realistic expectations of how much we can do. And, and so we need to operate at maximum efficiency in order to look like the big dogs without actually having the kind of money that the big dogs have, right? Uh, I might be, you know, uh, catering to the wrong crowd with a Brady Bunch reference, a bunch of college students, but, you know, boxes, boxes, boxes. It's the name of the game in esports coverage. Um, you need really strong switchers in esports to do esports well. Um, and a part of that is because esports relies so heavily on box effects. So this is a, a screenshot of a uh, show that I used to direct, uh, the Rocket League Championship Series. Um, and as you can see, we rely really heavily on these box effects. And, and so the reason we do that is that esports is kind of like boxing. Um, when the round is on, and I'm a director, right? So this is my perspective. If I cut away from those fighters, I'm gonna probably lose my job because I'm running a very real risk that I'm gonna miss the knockout punch. You can't predict when it's going to happen. Um, and esports is like boxing in that way, where it's wildly unpredictable. Anything can happen in any given second of any given game. And how the heck are we going to cut away from the boxers, right? The challenge, though, is that you can't actually see the boxers in boxing. You've, you're on them the whole time. So you see the emotion, you see the sweat, and maybe you see a renegade tooth flying out of their mouth. But in esports, you don't see that without using these boxes. And my um, philosophy is that like, look, I, I, I'm not here to make shows for the hardcore audience. The hardcore audience is going to watch anything that I show them because they care that much. I'm here to show somebody like my wife, Hey, this is cool. And this is real. My wife doesn't know what the heck is going on necessarily until she sees some kid slam his headset on the desk. And now she knows, Oh, something's going on here. Right. Oh, Oh, okay. I'm, and she starts to pick up what's, you know, she's starting to learn. Um, and so we do that with boxes, right? Uh, and you need, you need a powerful switcher to do that. Sometimes we get carried away um, with our box effects uh, and we do boxes sometimes within boxes. Uh, I've, I've, I've had mixed, I have mixed emotions about this. This is a show I directed. Um, I've had some directors say this was brilliant. I needed to show the crowd. We had a sold out arena of 15,000 people. First time that had ever happened in my career. And I was like, I got to show that. That's a story we got to tell, you know. Um, but I can't cut away from the game because freaking anything can happen. So we put boxes inside of freaking boxes. And I've had some directors say, hey, that was really cool. I really like that. I've had other directors say that's just absolute visual diarrhea. And, and please never do that again. And I kind of see both perspectives on it, I guess. I don't know. To me, it was a practical solution to a problem. Uh, another thing that esports really relies heavily on is data triggering um, a lot of things and kind of automating uh, certain parts of our productions. It's incredibly important. Esports happens way too fast. 
um, for statisticians to keep up, just never going to happen. Um, and, and so like, this is an example of a show that I directed from uh, a, a few years back called the H1Z1 Pro League. H1Z1 was sort of this like spiritual um, predecessor and forefather to like PUBG and Fortnite, where it's a battle royale. It was really the first of its kind. Um, and we were probably a couple years ahead of our time when we put this show together. Um, you know, it's like being early is no different than being bad. And we were early, so the show didn't get renewed. But uh, anyway, uh, we had this, this thought, which was that in a normal battle royale, the only way to win is to be the last team standing. And that means getting in fights is really bad. You don't, every fight you take is a, is a potentially at best or at worst a 50, 50 of whether you're instantly eliminated. So nobody fights in battle Royale games. And we hated that. So we came up with this idea where we wanted to encourage fighting. So getting a kill got you some points and then surviving to the end, got you a multiplier to those points. And the developers of the video game loved it. And they were like, but we have no way to support you. Um, so we had to choose a graphics renderer that could speak directly to the video game and then create this sort of uh, fox box for lack of a better way of putting it, right? This was being automatically updated based on the rules that the producers and I worked on to come up with just by the video game talking directly to our character generator, right? Um, and, and we would have been hosed without this. There's no way we could have told that story. We would have had to try, we were, we were having meetings talking about making it like figure skating. Maybe there's like a reveal of the score and that would have been terrible because then just what are the stakes for the whole 30 minutes of the match right it it didn't it wouldn't have worked so um yeah esports relies really heavily on this and this isn't the only game where it does uh, another thing you really need in esports is scalability in your solution the ability to kind of expand and contract rapidly using your technology um First of all, unless you're working directly for one of the big developers, you have no idea what video game you might be doing next week, right? Uh, I'm doing Rocket League on Wednesday, which is three on three. I'm doing Street Fighter Friday night, which is one on one. And then I'm doing Fortnite on Sunday all day, which is literally a hundred player free for all. And I've got one kit in my studio to do those shows with, right? And so I need to be able to restrict and contract um, operating positions, IO count, you know, that's why things like NDI are really popular in esports, right? It's like, yeah, we can do a little video compression if we can just constantly be scaling up and down, right? Um, another reason that it's kind of important to have a scalable solution is that this is a really common business practice in, in esports. So this was the Rocket League Championship Series, okay? We did the show on a mid-size production switcher, like a 36 in, 24 out, 3ME production switcher, okay? We had two character generators throwing out four channels of, of graphics and we had one replay. So this was our studio show where that kit was like, oh man, we, we got all the tools we need. You know, uh, the business decision was made by senior management that we just had to unrack that kit and do this show with it also because NEP wanted to charge 15 grand a day and we weren't paying it. Right. Um, not a knock on NEP, by the way, <laughs> like at all. But but that was the reality, kind of what I was saying earlier, right? Like we have modest budgets in esports. And so we had to have the ability to kind of scale up where, okay, that kit needs to get on the road and it needs to do a big show with a lot of screens. And we had, you know, some LED control in there. You can see we had to, it, it's tough to see, but those kind of player POV cams in front of the players, you know, we had to, we were using a ton of the resources, really max maxing out our kit um, on this show. And that's a common business practice still in esports, even as things have gotten a little bigger, if they can get away with just re-engineering it on the road, they'll just take that rack with them, right? Um, and then bring it back home. Um, the th last thing I'll get into, which I hope you guys all care about, it's probably what you're doing in school anyway, is like, well, getting the job. Um, you know, this is a smattering of potential employers for you um, as uh, broadcasting uh, technical professionals that you'll become when you guys earn your degrees and, and get out there and start working. Um, but another important point is that, you know, you don't just have to, it does, it's not just esports people that can hire you, right? Look, my, my degree, again, was in broadcast journalism. I thought I was going to be like a newsman, right? Um, 
And then I found this cool, lucky, serendipitous way to get into taking that same skill set into this totally brand new, crazy thing called esports. Um, and and so I would say, you know, when you're learning the skills of doing esports production, what you should really be thinking about learning is just the skills of doing production, right? Um, because there's you're, you're employable all over the place. If you can cut a show on a large production switcher. Um, you're employable in news, entertainment, sports, corporate. So, so really focus on the skills you're learning more than the content you're creating would be my advice to you at this point in your careers, right? As students, um, this is the career path I took uh, and it happened real fast. Uh, but this is a career path that still is very feasible in esports because even though it's, you know, that was eight years ago when I got started, I see people all the time just skyrocketing through their careers way faster than you'll ever do at a big network or in any other sort of a traditional um, entertainment sort of um, career, right? So yeah, I started as a PA, all of you will too. You'll be getting coffee and printing scripts. So that's what you're gonna do, but you're gonna interface with everyone and you're gonna learn. And then you're gonna have an opportunity to branch into all these different ways of uh, all these different directions. I went the direction of kind of like the creative uh, and the front bench, right? Um, and uh, a friend of mine who, oops, I went too far. A friend of mine who's now an engineer in charge um, for uh, at Comcast, uh, had a very rapid, fast growth of his career too. We started at the same time. We were PAs together. This guy named Mike Yulaki, a uh, good friend. Uh, and he went the more technical route, right? He was more interested in the, in that switcher panel and learning how to operate the Death Star. Uh, and I was more interested in saying, cool, you do that while I tell you which camera to choose. <laughs> um, but again, just like mine, his career took off so quick. You know, and and I don't want to set unrealistic expectations, but this is something that could happen for you guys too, right? And that's what you're here uh, in school to to do anyway, right? Is to get employed. So um, there's all sorts of other roles within esports, just like there are in any other production, right? You've got production coordinators, you got the money people, the line producers, right? Um, events. There's a really big um, need for uh, referees. That's what league operations is, what we're commonly call them in esports, right? Um, guys who make the rules, enforce the rules during the competition. That one's big. There's a lot of potential jobs there, you know. And if you know a video game really well, and you know the the tech um, to to help a guy, because the admins is, you know, the league operators are often also the first line of defense when a player's mouse doesn't work on stage, you know, you could get a job doing esports. Um, so look, you know, again, I know that it wasn't as technical as some of the other guys and uh, this is a technical conference, but I, I hope that this was informative for you guys. I know that uh, these are just all the questions I'm always getting all the time, even from technical people um, when they're asking me, what the heck is esports? So I hope you learned a thing. I'm definitely, going to be sticking around and happy to answer any questions as well when when we get to that point so thank you so much for having me um it is an honor and a privilege uh simpty uh to speak here and uh yeah that's all i've got thanks cameron that was great it really does tie into <clears throat> where the students interests are and it it may not be a pure tech uh uh presentation you did but it was uh very very valuable for all the students to hear so uh at this point in time uh we have a, a few questions from people and if you do have any questions this is uh your opportunity to ask them to really make sure you understand you're clear with you know some of the terminology some of the uh ideas and concepts that people have put forward you know you've got a great uh, a great contingent of, of students and a great contingent of professionals here so please uh ask away and i think nadia you uh do you have some questions already that some some people have posted yes rick i have a couple of questions so uh the first one is actually for renard uh and it's a question about the students membership the students empty membership uh do the students get access to the standards with their membership well you know that's a great question uh, a lot of the standards are actually free now 
we are uh, in the process of trying to make as many of them as we can available for use. So uh, the answer, the short answer to the question is yes. Cool. Thank you. Uh, next one, I'm actually going to ask Ryan. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about IP. Uh, what is the difference between IP in a broadcast studio and IP uh, streaming uh, to the home? In a broadcast studio, it'll probably be uncompressed, maintain the highest bit rate as possible, highest quality as possible within the facility. So it would just be like your baseband router, your baseband equipment. It's just that it's in, you know, encapsulated into IP as per hopefully the SIMD 2110 standard spec says it should be. Whereas in streaming, whereas in streaming it'll most likely or it will 100% be pretty highly compressed. You'll probably get a couple megabits per second per, for the signal or for the video. And obviously the quality will not be nearly as high as it is when it's fully uncompressed where there is no loss in any of the quality. I think that's the main differential there. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I have one question for Cameron. So we, Cameron, you touched up on Twitch, how uh, that has become a thing for the esports. Um, any thoughts on conventional sports like NFL, NWHL, uh, or NHL, uh, moving their content onto Twitch and relying less on cable TV? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I, I don't want to get too uh, philosophical or prognosticating, but uh, I don't see cable television really existing anything like it does within a decade, personally. Everything will be online, I think. You know, I just watched this. There was this big production last Sunday. I don't know if anybody saw it. Um, but uh, every other commercial was for Paramount and CBS's new streaming platform. I think they see the writing on the wall, too. And, and so Twitch specifically, I, I don't know. Twitch is going to have to reach the mainstream. Twitch is just uh, dominant in, in our culture, right? People who know about gaming and stuff. Um, but it's still sort of a mystery to the mainstream. So I think if not Twitch, a similar platform, 100%. Um, I have a follow-up for you, Cameron, as well. Uh, what about audio? Is it easier or harder in esports compared to regular sports uh, production? Yeah, I just had a conversation today with, uh, with a client about that. It's, it's really difficult in esports. Um, so without getting too into the weeds, the, the real challenge is the separating out all the audio sources that you have. So when you when you get the you're getting the audio embedded on the HDMI signal out of the back of the computer, and then you got to get that either into SMPTE or NDI or SDI or however you're going to get that into your broadcast, and then you got to you got to dis de embed that. But then you've also got the wrinkle of the player comms. The players need to talk to each other. And most producers, myself likewise, want to hear that. I want to mix that in to my production, right? Um, I hate quiet pictures, you know? And so that's where things get really challenging because the players, they all want to have their own mix control on their PC. Some players like a lot of game volume and a little lower on the comm volume. Some players listen to music. And their teammates, and they don't even, you know, depending on what video game they're playing, eh, the game audio doesn't really matter to them, right? So what we have to do is we have to give the players kind of the illusion of control. So usually what happens is we bring in all of the audio out of the computer, and then we send them back uh, their own customizable mix minus, and they get a little mix amp at their station where, okay, so they kind of, that way all the signals coming into audio are the same for a broadcast, right? And there's quality uh, control there, if you will. But then each player still does have the ability to tweak it to their own kind of liking and their own comfort. Um, so yeah, that requires, as you can probably tell, like a, a big audio board for what might not have been originally thought of to be such a big show. Um, so it, it, it can get really tricky. And, and again, I, audio gets muddy for me, so I'm not going to get too into weeds on it. Uh, I don't want to stick my foot in my mouth and say something stupid, but 
incredibly challenging and there's more to it than what I just said. That is the layman's way of saying it's complicated, so. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, Francois, um, I have a I, first of all, thank you so much. I think you have been answering a couple of questions throughout the, uh, when the other speakers are presenting, so thank you for that. Um, I got one question for you. Um, is there any fun or challenging one project that you can talk about? I think every project is <clears throat> fun and challenging in its way because there are three, I think, big difference between the feature film episodic industry and the broadcast industry. Uh, one of them is the, the fact that every project has its own workflow. You basically walk on set and there's a discussion as to how are we gonna move media from one place to the other? What are we gonna shoot and so on? So they're all unique, all unique. There's no template. The second one is comms. So I like that Cameron just talked about communication because on set communication is still done in many cases with walkie talkie. It is not done with intercom system. I know that when I was designing TV station, the first thing I would install was the intercom system so we can talk to each other while we rolled up the video and everything. Today, when you go on set, the first thing you install is lights to see the scene, to start thinking about it, then camera and communication is quite far behind. Uh, and the third one would be memory loss. I apologize, I'm getting too old. So there's a couple of, oh, time code. Time code is also different because in the broadcast industry, everything is sync. You have a box called a master sync generator. It goes to every box in a TV station. So everything is synchronized. So you can switch between different sources. You can route between different sources and so on. In the film industry, we do not have that because things move from the set to somebody's house, to a desert somewhere, whatever. We cannot have noise on the sound stage, so there cannot be any fans. So we tend to sync things wirelessly and we use time code instead of black bursts and tri-level tri sync. So I would say every time you walk into a new project, you try to see how it evolves, how it's different. But I think in the end, what's fascinating is how much time is spent crafting the picture, how much takes are taken before the, the director of photography and the director says, that's the shot. So I think that's quite amazing. Thanks, Ronsa. Uh, I got, have one more for Ryan. Uh, so is there any issues with IP? Is there any problems or things that are not working quite yet? Within a specific production facility? Um... You know, I, I think you can run into issues where things aren't working properly, but a lot of that can be based on, you know, possibly poor design or poor commissioning strategies. Um, like, as an example, you know, uh, PTP, for example, distributing reference across a facility. That can definitely be problematic if it's not done right. And I think actually recently a, a SMPTE paper um, published by Lee Whitcomb was recently released in, in a SMT journal that actually reviews the commissioning best best practices for commissioning these types of systems. So as we're all learning things from new more facilities being converted into IP, we're learning more best practices so that events that might have triggered systems to not necessarily work 100% are kind of being rectified on the fly as we're learning more and more and as products are evolving more and more. So yeah, I, I've definitely seen issues before in facilities, but a lot of that does come down to just possibly poor design and poor commissioning strategies, which we're all learning about now. Cool. Thank you, Ryan. Sure. Uh, that's all I have in the chat box, Rick. Sure. Do we have any questions from uh, people other than students and not just in chat? Hey, <laughs> Rick. Tony, Tony here. Uh, if I if I can just not so much a question, but more of a, uh, I guess a comment. Um, you know, it's been talked about. Uh, you know, Francois saying that he has a memory loss, and you know, all of us that are semi-retired, somewhat, um, those are uh, frequent moments. I I, I got to tell the the crowd here, and mainly focus this onto the students. Man, I wish I was your age right now because the the technology and the tools that you have available today 
that we didn't have, but we, we had them in different ways, but they were costly, like color correctors, for example, and I'll just speak of that, and even cameras. You know, you were talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, you, you can buy a, a color grading system for under $1,000. You, can, you, can ha you have your iPhone, and iPhones have made movies. So there's so many tools that, that you have that, that um, will allow you to branch out. And as Cameron said, it's, it's, it's almost, it's open for you to, uh, you know, generate your own company and, and uh, focus on something that you, you really admire doing and running with it. And uh, I, I think you'd be amazed and, you know, just to, to kind of circle around and and bring Simti back into this. You know, we're all here to to help. You know, uh, just reach out. You know, if any of us can uh, can um, help you connect the dots to somebody that we might know that can help you move to the next level, I, I think you you'll be hard pressed to find one of us not helping you out. So. You know, it's uh, another way of saying, uh, yeah, it's, it's up to you. It's just, um, yeah, kind of get engaged and get involved. It wasn't a question, it was more of a comment, Rick. A very, a very valuable comment. Like I, like I said, now's, now's your opportunity, students, this moment, but also this moment in time. Uh, I, I could go back very far as well, Tony, and speak to, uh, I worked at, at at EMI Abbey Road Studios, and I remembered, D, and this may be an audio thing, uh, uh, but I, I worked de-hissing and de-popping uh, old opera albums, uh, and it was a whole building that had the technology to do this. And now I think you can de you can de-hiss and de-pop on Adobe Premiere Pro or uh, on your phone, kind of thing. So it's you know. You, you've got technology, you've got great people on your side. Now's the time to sort of take advantage of it all. I think we do have another question that came up too. We do, Rick. Um, so it's, it's from Graham and it's to Francois. Uh, what do you think about integration of uh, ARRI cameras into live multi-camera productions, such as the recently uh, what happened during the Super Bowl halftime show? What are the challenges here, bringing cinematic tech to live broadcast systems? It's a really good question. I'm going to try to keep it as vendor neutral as possible. Uh, in this case, yes, it was shot with about 10 cameras, a mix of everything. And yes, they happen to be our cameras for the halftime show. Uh, it was a Canadian artist. The weekend was a Canadian artist. And I will mention something about Canada before I go into other things. Simti Toronto is a little bit unique. And I think this is something probably students might not know. Uh, if you look at the people here in this room, uh, we've all worked for different Canadian companies. And it's important to understand that most of the broadcast companies are coming from Canada. That it would be Ross, that it would be uh, uh, Miranda Grass Valley, that it would be Evers, that it would be uh, Imagine, Harris, uh, Leach, known by different names, that it would be camera positioning with cast, that it would be all the special effects, that it would be Auto Autodesk Maya 3D Studios, that it would be Udini in Toronto that won tons of prizes. It seems surprising, and it's important for you to understand that in that market, SIMT, the Toronto chapter, is extremely fortunate to have so many companies around in the Ontario and Quebec region that can support us because they're leading the way. So extremely unique, it needed to be mentioned. Uh, as far as the Super Bowl, I think the message here is that what we've been seeing the last couple of years, which aligns exactly to what Cameron was mentioning, is that people are moving from traditional broadcast TV consumption to streaming, OTT over the air. And with that transition, we saw some much higher end productions. So in the old days, when we talked about internet TV, for many people here, that meant 320 by 240. That was low quality. And that's when Netflix appeared. Today, it's not that at all. So in that transition to bring the viewer to OTT, we basically see 
Hollywood A-lister. We're starting to see some top actors moving into these OTT platform that would be Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, and so on. It comes with directors from the film industry. It comes with director of photography from the film industry. It comes with lighting director or gaffer from the film industry. So the production quality, the production value is going up. And because it's going up, people now are following channels, not only on the content, but on the quality as well. They need, both need to be there. So I think that people are used to the cinematic look. Uh, there are some cases like sports where a, a look that is maybe less cinematic, but that will give you a deeper depth of field and something more crisp is going to be much better. It really depends on the content. But overall, there's definitely much more interest for people to bring the premium quality up. Why? Because they're trying to keep customers on their channel. And right now the OTT is definitely trying to drive that business. But I see broadcaster also lifting up their quality to get a look that is unique. And it's all about quality content and availability everywhere, anytime. Thanks, Francois. Back to you, Rick. That's all the questions I can see here. So uh, if no other questions from anybody, oh, can someone define quality from Gary? Uh, can you define what you mean by <laughs> defining quality? Uh, if, if I may, I would say yeah. this could be a two hour discussion, either technical or artistic. And I'm sure that most director of photography that you're going to work with are going to say, no, 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 stop talking about numbers. Don't show me your scope. I don't want to see a waveform vector scope. I don't want to see an MTF chart. I want to see this. And I think we're in a world where we really have two separate vision, the artistic side and the technical side. And what we have to do on the technical side is ensure that all the data is there that the CRC checks some matches and that we have proper transmission through the lens and then the codec and everything so that the artist can create that story and bring it to the end viewer. But there's psychology behind every single shot and the way they place everything. When I talk about quality, every single thing that is placed in the picture has a reason to be there. Thank you. So it's, it's quality, uh, artistic and technical and uh, to give another little uh, brief, long time ago also, I, used, I shot a series for CBC and the technician said uh, there was a problem with my images because there was, there were no, the blacks weren't at 7.5 units. And I said, well, there's nothing really black in the scene and, and the fight went on. Well, there has to be something white and something that reaches black. And I went, but it's about the art and it's about the story. So this went on for three weeks with producers pulling a few hairs out. So I guess there is always that um, difference of opinion at times between technical standards and artistic standards. So, uh, oh, another question. Um, would you say SIMTI standards affect, from Lena, would you say SIMTI standards affect incoming technologies, phones, et cetera, or does SIMTI adapt to incoming technology. So this could be any of our wonderful panelists. I'll, I'll take that one. The, the answer to that is both. Um, SIMTI is very proactive in trying to uh, be on the front end of what's needed in order to create interoperability between um, uh, signals and between um, products. Um, it does not cater to any specific product. It is simply about trying to make sure that what we create can work within that space. Um, do they adapt to incoming technology? Yes. As things like virtual production continue to gain speed and eSport continue to gain speed, Simpty will be focused on the technology that's needed as well as the standards that's going to be required to make that technology work. Thank you, Renard, and good question. Okay, any other questions? So it looks like no other questions. I'd like to, at this point, I guess, thank, uh, first of all, all our wonderful guest speakers for coming uh, and spending the time with us and spending the, the uh, making the effort to educate and help students in their paths forward. 
Uh, I, we really appreciate it all. So thank you all, uh, all speakers, Ryan and Cameron and Renard and Francois and Cliff who isn't here. And uh, uh, so thank you all very much for, for everything and for helping out. And students, I hope you've uh, learned. I hope it was a good session for you. Uh, Simpty does post uh, recordings of the meeting. So if there's something you missed uh, or if there's something, uh, any other information you want, certainly please reach out to me or reach out to any of the Simpty Toronto uh, board members. And with that, I thank you all for, for showing up. Before you go, oh. uh, Rick, I just got a couple of closing slides here. Um, oh, sorry, yes, Tony. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. I, I just want to bring this slide back up and it's, it's kind of... Um, encapsulate what uh, Renard was talking about earlier, but the key takeaway is that uh, first year membership is free. So all students that haven't yet joined SIMTI, I think it would be a, in uh, a good, um, you know, assistance in, in career moves to join the organization and, uh, you know, reach out and um, do ask for guidance if, if, we can help, we can assist. And you know what, if we can't at the moment, we will then find a way to be able to do that. Uh, I am a firm believer that, uh, you know, if you have two people in the room and one person gets guidance or assistance to get where he wants to go, and the other person is still standing there going like, okay, do I turn left, do I turn right? The person that asks for direction or guidance uh, will get to where he wants to go a lot quicker. And, and I, I think that's, you know, uh, the same as when, when you talk about career moves, do reach out, you know, become part of the, the family. And, and, and I think, um, you know, first year being free and additional years being um, um, a couple of dollars uh, above $10 is not a bad, bad situation. So you can go to simply.org and it'll direct you to uh, a, a join me page. And um, there are way there is a section for students that you can meet, you can go to. A um, couple of things on the post meeting side. Um, we are going to be sending you a survey that'll that'll come out tomorrow. Um, we are really interested in your feedback. You know, we want to know whether or not we're doing the right thing. This is our second um, attempt at uh, a student focused uh, event in February. Are we hitting all the right check boxes? Are, 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 are we sharing with you the information that you feel is valuable? And if so, then do share that back with us because we're here to learn as much as you are in making sure that we, we do hit the mark. Um, the contest will end, so we would like to get your survey completed by the 12th, which I think is Friday. Uh, and we will reach out to the winners uh, on uh, Monday, I think it is. And winners, I mean, there are five Starbucks gift cards that we will be handing out uh, electronically. Um, again, as Rick mentioned, um, the meeting is recorded tonight. Um, so if you want to go back and read some of the bios, read that long list of, of why you want to uh, join SIMTI, you can just hit pause. And um, so there will be a URL link within the uh, post email that you'll be getting, or it's uh, uh, SIMTI Toronto YouTube channel. Search that on your favorite browser, search browser, and it will take you there. Um, future meetings, we have a meeting on ATC3 in March, April, and May, and June. Those are the following uh, topics that we have slated for that time period, but could, could change uh, dependent on uh, uh, whether uh, we get uh, the talent together for that. And again, in June, we're looking at doing the technical conference, which is going to be either a three, two, three day event where we will have rounds of papers, uh, roundtable discussions. And, and again, this is something that uh, I strongly, strongly recommend that you earmark in your calendar because this will be uh, a lot of information that we'll be sharing. Uh, here's some of the locations that um, you can um, uh, 
get some more information, there is the Toronto section uh, website. There's the URL to join. There are uh, membership assistance if anybody's been laid off, furloughed, retired. Um, um, so do reach out to SEMTI and say, hey, you know what, this is what, what position I'm in. Can you help me out? And they'll, they'll do whatever they can to make that uh, come together for you. And there's a URL there if you want to become a friend of the Toronto section where you'll start getting uh, email notices for the various meetings that we do have on a monthly basis. And again, socially, Facebook, Twitter, and our email address. And if you want to get to us that way as well. So again, last slide or second last slide, uh, stay safe, be well. And uh, at the end, this is a wrap. And uh, thank you very, very much. I think we hit uh, upwards into the 147 people that were on the call or on the uh, Zoom. Um, great, great numbers, guys. Uh, thank you so much. And I really thank the, uh, the presenters uh, in spending uh, a couple of hours with us and sharing that wealth of information with our membership and student base. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks very much.